us and for us as we continue that work. Um, you can take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 4. I will um, mention again, thank you so much uh, for praying for my, my father. Uh, they arrived back in the United States um, this last Tuesday, had the meeting with the, the surgeon there in Fargo on Thursday. Um, and he was very optimistic, uh, having looked at all of the, the appropriate scans and tests and feels that the cancer is uh, localized there in the one spot in the colon and feels that they will be able to uh, remove all of that uh, uh, through surgery on Wednesday. Uh, and it is even his hope at this point that there would not be a need for, for any follow-up chemotherapy. Uh, and that is certainly our hope and our prayer. Uh, but uh, uh, we have certainly been blessed and, and overwhelmed by the number of people that are, are praying for him and praying for our family and do appreciate that. And, and God is answering prayer. It, is, it, is, it has been working in a number of areas. I mean, the Lord has certainly, uh, I mean, after the original diagnosis and, and everything that goes along with that, any of you that have had close family members uh, and you've just heard that word, cancer, you know what that's all about. Uh, but the Lord has certainly uh, 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 answered prayer in it being very treatable and, and the doctors being very optimistic and, and things looking very good that way, as well as just opportunities to, to share the gospel, relationships that have been uh, rekindled and encouragement it's been to, to some of the folks in South Africa uh, and, and a little bit of a spur to some of them to, to see their need to, to step up and carry on in the ministry. Um, and, and, and so many good things that we're already seeing come from this. But continue, please, to pray for, for my father for the surgery uh, as well as his recovery. Uh, and then certainly, I know my father would ask you to, to primarily pray for my mother. Uh, I've probably been harder on her than, than anyone. You know, she was the, uh, 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 the one, you know, the doctor comes in and says, I'm sorry, it's cancer. Um, and, you know, that's all the original statement is. Uh, you know, I can't imagine what, uh, what was going through her mind at that point, but uh, God has been, has been good and his grace has been sufficient as he's promised it would be. But please continue to pray for them. Philippians chapter 4, and we will read verses 1 down to verse number 20 um, as our text this evening. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Iodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned, and received, and heard, and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all, and abound, I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory, by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to 
meet together this evening and Lord to open the word of God. Lord, I do pray that you would meet with us these few moments as we examine the scriptures. Lord, speak to our hearts. Lord, challenge us from your word. Lord, I pray that these folks would be blessed, that they would be encouraged, and Lord, that they would be challenged uh, to the work of the gospel. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I want to speak for a few moments this evening on the subject of the bigger picture of giving and receiving. And what we see in this chapter is Paul writing back to a now supporting church, uh, and he is commending them. Uh, he is commending them for the role that they have in his ministry, their, their, their uh, support of him, the encouragement they are. Uh, and he gives us some truths about how this relationship should work, uh, the ideal relationship between a missionary and a supporting church. Now, first of all, we need to be reminded of the context of the relationship. Hey, Paul uh, begins this portion of scripture in verse number, uh, uh, um, verse number one, he encourages them to so stand fast in the Lord. And uh, he ends it in verse number 20 there by saying, now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever, amen. Uh, and this is the context of really the book. Uh, when you look at the, 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 the book of Philippians and many of Paul's writings, really, you see these phrases, in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, uh, uh, and, and so forth. I mean, Paul is really uh, stressing um, where we should exist, you know, where we should live. That was, uh, I noticed that in the, the Sunday school uh, lesson this morning related to Philemon, as, as Paul encouraged him to acknowledge the, the good things that are in you in Christ. And so God is working these things in you in as much as you are where you're supposed to be. Uh, you are in Christ. And so that is the, the context of the relationship. It is a spiritual relationship. You know, uh, sometimes we can get caught up in the idea that this uh, missionary uh, supporting church is a business. You know, that we're looking at different missionaries, we're, we're examining resumes, you know, we're looking at cost-benefit analysis, you know, it's like, how many guys is this guy having saved? How many churches has he started? You know, how many pastors is he training? You know, where are we going to get the, the best bang for our buck here? You know, what, what, what's the best investment? Um, that's not how this works. Amen. It is a spiritual relationship, and it is in Christ. Uh, and that is the, the, the context of this relationship, but it was one of giving and receiving. Uh, and related to that, then we see the bigger picture here uh, in these verses. First of all, in verse number three, I want to draw your attention to what a supporting church and a missionary are to each other. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. Hey, when you talk about a supporting church and a missionary, that should be the relationship. We are yoke fellow. Now, when you, you consider what that means, I mean, we know what a, a yoke is. That is the implement by which two beasts of burden uh, are connected to each other for the purpose of doing the same work for the same master. Mm -hmm. right, that is what a yoke does. Uh, uh, you know, it's like one animal in the yoke isn't, isn't in charge of the other animal. Um, it is yoked together and you're serving the same master. And so a relationship between a, a supporting church and a missionary should be that. We are both working for the same master. Now that's one of the reasons I feel strongly um, that the work going on on a mission field and the work going on at a local church in the United States should bear some remarkable similarities. Amen. You know, I, 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 I would wonder, you know, how most churches would respond if, you know, I came back after, you know, three years on the field, and in my presentation, I flipped to one slide, okay, it's like we arrived on the field, we rented this building, I hung a sign out front, and then I came and sat in a pew for three hours every week. That's good. And that's what I did, because we're yoke fellow, and I was doing the same thing you were. Now, it's like, I'm, I'm blessed by this church. I was tremendously blessed uh, being at the men's prayer meeting this morning. Uh, and a number of folks mentioning people that they were specifically uh, involved in evangelizing and people that they were, uh, had witnessed to in the past week and people that they're having Bible with. And, and I've heard talk about the, the Allentown outreach and such. And I know that this church uh, uh, is, is interested in that thing. I mean, it's like you come back here and it's, it's like talking to missionaries. They're looking for new ways to, to reach their community with the gospel and, and ways to outreach. And that's the way it should be, uh, both here as well as on the mission field. It should look the same because we are in the same yoke doing the same job. 
We also see, then Paul gives a, 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 a bit of a statement in verses 4 down to verse 8, just some instruction, encouragement to this church on how they're supposed to operate. In verse number 4, Paul says, uh, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Uh, a church should operate with joy. With joy. And now we know that, as, as I've mentioned, the context of this chapter, he's going to relate to giving and receiving. So, yea, even in the act of giving... Uh, we can rejoice. You know, even if, if the preacher and the missionary start preaching on, on giving to missions and taking out your wallet, we can rejoice. It's something that can be done with joy. But Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, we again understand the context. It is in the Lord. Right? If we're looking for our joy to come from this world, it's not going to happen. Right. Right. Now, our rejoicing does need to be in the Lord, but uh, it does need to be rejoicing. Now, that's why Paul says that twice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. I, I tell people that second rejoice is there for guys like me. You know, they, they, they talk about, the, uh, are you a glass half full or a glass half empty kind of guy? I'm a, the glass is half empty, and that means the glass is probably broken, and it's been leaking, and now I'm either going to have to fix or replace the glass. Okay, that's, that's my perspective on things. Uh, I'm not a natural rejoicing kind of guy. And so uh, that second rejoice is there for guys like me, the guys that would, would try to spiritualize it away. Well, he's, you know, rejoice in the Lord. It's a spiritual rejoicing. He's not actually saying I ever have to crack a smile or anything. I mean, this is, this is spiritual. I don't actually have to be happy. But Paul says, no, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say Amen. rejoice. Yes. It is how we are to operate. Then he says in verse number five, let your moderation be known unto all men. Now, he's not talking about, uh, uh, um, you know, as this word is often used in our culture, uh, 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 moderation in, 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 in imbibing of certain beverages. That's not what he's talking about. This word moderation specifically means to be equitable, to fa be fair. Think of a moderator. If you're having a debate, if you're going to have a good debate, you need a moderator, a person that is going to remain objective and see that the topic is dealt with uh, uh, appropriately and fairly and gently. Uh, and that is the job of a moderator. And Paul is writing to, to these Christians, to this New Testament church, and he said, be known for that. Be known for your moderation. Now, this is something we can struggle with sometimes. You know, we can, we can be prone to uh, fanaticism. Now, I'm not talking about being moderate as far as, you know, moving away from our standards and our convictions. I'm talking about how we're known for discussing them. That's what Paul is talking about here. Uh, be known as moderate. Be, don't be known out there in the world as the person who can't be talked to. You know, I, I'm afraid sometimes, you know, as Christians, we can have that reputation. You know, don't ever mention the words Second Amendment around so-and-so, because he'll go off on it. You know, don't mention, you know, whatever amendment is, is coming up, whatever bill they're trying to pass, whatever new tax is coming through, whatever uh, uh, candidate is running for office, because, I mean, you just won't hear the end of it. That's what Paul is saying. Be known for your moderation. Okay, be able to deal with difficult topics in a way that is fair and gentle. Amen. And we should be known for that. That's how we should operate. And then he goes on and says, Be careful for nothing, there in verse number 6, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing. Don't be, don't be worried. We know where he's not talking about, you know, ride your motorcycle without a helmet type. Uh, uh, be careful for nothing there. He's saying don't worry. Don't be consumed with, with worry uh, because we have an option. Okay, as Christians, we have an option. Be careful for nothing but... Uh, by prayer and supplication. That word prayer simply means speaking to God. You know, I have a tendency sometimes when, when things aren't going well, and I typically do this while I'm driving. I'm driving and I start running it around in my head. I start having a conversation with myself. And it starts here and it just starts going, you know, down, down, down to the worst possible common denominator that the entire world's ending and everything's going to uh, 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 be the end of the world. I mean, and I, I have that conversation with my, what Paul is saying here is we have an option. Rather than doing that and having that conversation with ourselves and creating worry and fear, we just start addressing those comments to God. Amen. 
we start talking to him. When, when we start having those fears and those doubts and those worries and those concerns, we don't have to be careful about them. We just have to take and, and begin talking to God. And then he says that we, by supplication, uh, with thanksgiving, can, can make these needs known to God. We have the right to ask for things. That's what that word supplication means. We have the right to ask God for things. We can do that. We can go and say, God, here's the need, and we need you to do something. But he gives us some instruction with thanksgiving. You know, it's, uh, it's something in, in South Africa, it's big. I know it's really big in America. This idea that the only teaching in the Bible on prayer is ask and you shall receive. You know, that's, that's the only thing the Bible ever said about prayer, right? Ask and you shall receive. You know, that's, that's the Bible's complete teaching on prayer. No, it's not. You know, he gave us other instructions. Pray in my name. Pray according to my will. He gave us another one here. By supplication with thanksgiving. Okay, when we're going to go and ask God for something, God says, I require that you do it with an attitude and the language of thanksgiving. Stop and think about what I've already done for you, how many things I've already provided, how good I've been, and now bring your request to me. And that really changes the way you ask for things. Yes, amen. <laughs> But I want you to notice one other thing quickly here related to, again, the context. Go with me to verse number 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. This church had been careful about their missions giving. They had been worried about it. They had seen the, the need. They understood Paul was going through hard times, and they wanted to do more. They wanted to be able to give more. They, wanted to, they understood the need for the gospel to, to reach into the regions beyond them, and they knew that they didn't have the means to do it, and so they had been careful about it. And we know that that, that I mean, that's, that's all of four verses later, that was on Paul's mind as he wrote, be careful for nothing, but by prayer and supplication. You know, when it comes to giving to missions, that's something we need to, to, to talk to God about. That's something we pray about, and that's something we make supplication about. God, we want to do more. You know, we can be careful for, for really one of two reasons. Some people are careful because they really see the need, and they really do feel that they have done and are doing everything they can. You know, Lord, I am, I am maxed out. I am giving everything that I can to the cause of Christ and the cause of missions. And Lord, I want to do more. And Paul says, if that's your situation, don't be worried about it. Just, just bring that to God. God will, God will meet the need. God has a plan. You know, the other reason we can be careful is, is the fact that we, we aren't giving or we're not giving as much as we should because we're careful about this world. You know, I've got bills to pay. I've got a mortgage. You know, interest rates are, are, are fluctuating, and, and I don't know what it's going to be next month, and, and my car payment is going up, and I've got to get new tires, and, and I've got kids that are finishing high school and, and are going to go off to college, and you know what that costs, and, and I've got all of these things. I've got a kid who needs braces and another one that had a trip to the ER, and I can't afford to give any more to missions. I can't, I can't afford to do any more. There's just too many cares of this world. Paul says, be careful for nothing. By prayer and supplication, let your needs be made known. You know, take it to God. God. God can meet the need. God will meet the need if we take it to Him. And this is specifically here in this context. You are careful about giving. Don't be careful about that. Take it to God. God, I mean, you, you know, it, it amazes me. I love hearing the testimonies. You know, when God said, I own the cattle on a thousand hills, you know, I was recently in a church, I mean, where another church in town closed down and gave them their building. I mean, a $500,000 building, just gave it to them. You know, and I'm like, when God says, you know, we were, I was talking with the pet, when God says, I own the, the cattle on a thousand hills, I mean, currently, they might be under the control of the Methodist church, but they're God's. And when he wants to give them to his people, he'll do it. Amen. I mean, if we, if we bring our cares before him, that's what God can do Amen. and what God will do. Be careful for nothing. And then he says in verse number, verse number 8, a verse familiar to most of us, 
are uh, uh, just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Paul is encouraging this church to operate with focus. Right? He's telling you, think about these things. Okay, these are the things your mind should be occupied with. Things that are, as he says, true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. Do you know if any of those things are streaming on Netflix this week? You know, is, is Hulu running those this month? I mean, I'm pretty sure they're not on CBS or NBC. That's what Paul is saying. Okay, there is a lot of things in this world that are, are attracting our, our time and our thought and our focus. And if we're going to be serious about serving God and we're going to be what we're supposed to be, we have to be very, very, very careful about what we're thinking about. Now, when you begin to, to take a, 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 a just a cursory look at these words and you know, word search them in the scriptures, you'll find two things that, that pretty much meet all of these qualifications. The Lord Jesus Christ himself and the word of God. Amen. He wants us to be focused. And it's getting harder and harder, but it's a determination we have to make. Then we go on and in verse number 14, we see what a supporting church does. Paul writes here and says, Notwithstanding ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. That word affliction means a pressing, a pressing together, a pressure. And I know this church, you're familiar with this. You've had your missionaries come back off the field, and I'm sure they've told you that truth. There is a pressure that is relieved when you come home. I mean, when you walk back into, into this building particularly and you meet with this church, there is a pressure that is removed. There is a pressure to being on that mission field. You know, when you walk into, uh, 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 Brother Hammett was telling me over, over lunch some stories of spending time over in, in Thailand, and I know they run into this in places in, in South Africa where you can go into uh, a place like, you know, Quantum Booth, 130,000 people, uh, and there's an outside chance that you're one of a half dozen that might truly be saved. I mean, that's, that's just the reality uh, on a foreign mission field sometimes. And I mean, the, 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 the pressure that you feel, spiritual pressure. And Paul is saying, you have ministered to that. Okay, as a faithful supporting church, you have eased that pressure by your support, by that remembrance that, you know, each time... Each time, you know, it's like we receive some letters. We receive, uh, each month I, I go through and do the financial statement and I, I see that support check come in and it's a reminder that there is a church in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania that is committed to this work. Amen. That I'm able to maintain my place on the field, that I'm able to continue to go out and preach the gospel, that my desire to see souls saved and churches established is also felt by a group of people across the world that are praying and sacrificing and giving to this work and that ministers to my affliction. That is what you're able to do by in being involved in missions. Paul goes on and, and mentions the reputation of a, a supporting church in verse number 16. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity. You know, we talked about the fact that we're to pray and seek God and, and trust God by faith uh, uh, for what he would have us to give and, and such. And, and I believe you folks understand that and, and, and giving by faith. Well, God wants us to give by faith, but he does also want us to give faithfully. This church gave once and again while he was in Thessalonica. They had a desire and a reputation for being faithful to this work. And I mean, we understand that the only way a church can be faithful in giving to missions is if the people are faithful in giving to missions. That's what a, 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 the reputation a church should have. Then we see in verses 10 and verse number 18 what it is a supporting church really gives. In verse number 10, Paul wrote, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me flourished again. By giving to missions, you give rejoicing to the missionaries. 
you give rejoicing. You know, when I, when I see, that, when I see that, uh, uh, that number across the, uh, 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 the spreadsheet, now it, it's not about the amount. You know, it's like the, the vast majority of my supporting churches don't send enough money to pay for my petrol for the month. You know, and so we can easily get the idea, well, what difference does it make? You know, it's such a tiny amount. What, what, what is it going to do? It's, it's not about the physical. See, when, I, when, when a missionary sees that number, you're reminded again, as I mentioned, that there's a, a group of people that are sacrificing and giving so that you can continue the work that God has called you to do. But you're also reminded that there is a church over in Pennsylvania that is preaching the gospel in their area, and they are seeking to reach their community with the gospel of Christ, and that there is a, 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 a co-laborer, there is that yoke fellow operating over there. You know, I've had a few, a few churches where the numbers stopped appearing because the church closed down. You know what that does for a missionary? I mean, not only does it now, you know, begin to, to raise questions about your own viability where you are, but it's a reminder that there's a place where there used to be a gospel witness in America that now needs one. There's now a need for a missionary someplace else. Not only has it gotten more difficult for me where I am, but now I'm burdened with the fact that this area is in need of a missionary. So your faithful support truly brings rejoicing. Paul was not only blessed by what he received, but it was a reminder, these folks in Philippi are still faithful. They're committed to this work of the gospel. I know what they're doing there in Philippi, and they're proving it by what they want to see me doing here where I am. And it brought rejoicing. And then in verse number 18, Paul said, But I have all and abound, and I am full. Now, I can't explain that any more than Paul does right there. You know, again, the, the dollar amount doesn't explain that. We know that this church at Philippi was poor. You know, this was not some mammoth sum that they had sent to the Apostle Paul that was going to meet all of his needs for the next two years as he was in, in jail in Rome. I mean, that, that's not what this was. But the statement was, because you've done what God wanted you to do, and you've, you've encouraged me, you've ministered to my affliction, you've brought rejoicing, you've been faithful, you've brought your care before the Lord, and the Lord has, has supplied, I'm now full. But not only am I full, I abound. Not only do I abound, I have all. Hey, that, that's what happens when we do our part, and then we let God do his part. You know, this church had been worried. We can't do anything. And finally, this, this one guy, Epaphroditus, you know, I don't know who he was. You know, whether he was a, a young guy who sold his house and moved back into his parents' basement so he could take the money and, and, and give it to the Apostle Paul, whether he was an old guy who took an early retirement and a, and a buyout and, 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 you know, moved in with his kids so that he could give that retirement amount to the Apostle Paul. We have no idea who Epaphroditus was. But God used him to minister to the Apostle Paul through this church at Philippi. And God used whatever that amount was to cause Paul to say, I am full, I have all, I abound. And that is the fact. That is what God does when you give. Amen. Then we see what a supporting church receives in verse number 17. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Uh, that verse excites me as a church member, okay? as a member of Bible Baptist Church who participates in missions giving. That verse excites me. Um, you know, it's like I enjoy reading missionary letters because I like to know how I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes where I'm actually ministering, things get rough and difficult and discouraging. So I, I start reading through other missionary letters that, 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 that I support to see how I'm really doing. I'm like, oh, okay, things are going pretty well, you know? Amen. Brother Kastner up there in Botswana had a few folks saved and, and, and man, things are going great, you know? Um, but that's what, it's, that's what you receive. It's fruit to your account. Now, now Jesus told us that our Father is glorified if we bear much fruit. 
Okay, that is something God wants us to do. That is something that brings glory to God. If we say we want to glorify God, then we will give to missions. Because it will bear fruit and it will glorify our Father. And I personally think we should be interested in how that is going. You know, I, I worry about any farmer who doesn't care how his crop is turning out. That is what a church receives, fruit to your account. Then we see what a, fr a supporting church accomplishes in verse 18 and 19, or verse 18. Paul writes, But I have all in a bound, I have full, having received of Epaphroditus, the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And we know the language that he uses here harkens back to the days of the tabernacle and the temple, the, 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 the altar of incense and the uh, brazen altar of sacrifice where the nation of Israel would go and offer. And there was particular requirements. You know, you couldn't just go in there and, and offer whatever incense you wanted in whatever way you wanted. God had left a, a particular commandment. It has to be offered this type of oils mixed, burned on this altar with this fire. And if you'll do that, I'll be pleased. You know, a couple of Aaron's sons learned the hard way that God was serious about that. It was the same with the sacrifice. When God required a sacrifice, he was very specific. It wasn't the same for everyone. Depending on your economic ability and such, there would be differences in, in what you had to bring. But you had to bring what God required. And if you did that, it would be accepted. So, you know, we understand in this life, not everything we do is an odor of a sweet smell and a sacrifice acceptable. But when we give to the cause of missions, it is. That's what God is saying in his word here. If you'll do this, God views that as an odor of a sweet smell. That is a sacrifice acceptable. Now, I, I want to please God. I hope you do too. And this is a way that God has told us, this pleases me. Amen. We should want to do that. Amen. On a side note, as it relates to sacrificial giving, you know, um, I'm sure Brother Holland can tell us that, you know, it's like coming from a place like Papua New Guinea to come back and talk about, you know, sacrificial giving as we often consider it in America is, you know, not even possible. And we often think of sacrificial giving, meaning giving till it hurts. In America, I mean, that's beyond our comprehension. I mean, how much would I have to give before it hurt uh, in America if I judge myself by the rest of the world's standards? Sacrificial giving is not about giving till it hurts. And when you look in the Old Testament, I mean, when Abraham went and built an altar and offered a couple of oxen on it, do you think that that financially hurt him? I mean, he was the richest man in the world. You know, when David and, I mean, Solomon, you know, it's like, I mean, he built the temple and he offered them by the thousands. And I mean, he had so little left over that all he could do is pave the streets with silver. I mean, it was a financial hardship. The key to sacrificial giving is giving what God told you to give. That's what was an appropriate sacrifice throughout the scriptures. You gave what God said to give. Right. That is what a sacrifice is. It's not us deciding what's appropriate. Not us deciding what, what, what we need to do. Amen. But when we listen to God and we obey God, that is a sacrifice acceptable. Amen. And that's what these folks had done. Then lastly, we see what a supporting church is promised in verse number 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That is a tremendous promise. And I'm not going to qualify it, because God doesn't. He's writing to a New Testament church, and he says, because you have done this, because you have supported missions in this way, because you have supported the, the work of the gospel around the world, because you've committed yourself to this, I will meet your every need. Amen. That's God's promise to a New Testament church. Now, that is the specific application to a church. You know, and I think uh, I enjoy, you know, going to, to, to so many of my supporting churches, and I see the truth of that. 
You know, with the, 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 the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars you folks have invested in taking the gospel elsewhere, you know, the fear could be, well, we don't have, we don't have what we need here. But I look around and you folks have a lot of things that you need here. And the time will come if you need more, God will say, I will meet that. Just as he has done every step of the way. If you will give and you will go and you will give to those who go, I will meet your need. God has made that promise. Now, there is a secondary application because the church is made up of individuals and people that that promise has to extend to those individuals and people. That God will meet your need. The way he will meet Lehigh Valley Baptist Church's need is by meeting the needs of his people. That is the promise. Now, I know... And I hope that this message, by and large, has been an encouragement to you. This church uh, has been a tremendous blessing to my family uh, over many years, uh, to our church, uh, uh, truly a church we consider to be uh, like-minded um, and, and, and of the same heart. Now, I find it interesting, in the beginning of this chapter, um, in Philippians 4, Paul, in verse number 2, I beseech Iodius and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Um, and I've often and heard and, and thought, you know, that these two, uh, and most people believe it to be two ladies in the church, uh, had a bit of a quarrel with each other. Uh, having read through the, the book, taught through the book, and, and seeing that phrase, like-minded, mentioned a few other times, uh, uh, as I got to this chapter, uh, I seriously began to consider whether Paul was, in fact, encouraging these two ladies, uh, or two men, or, or whoever they ended up being, that they needed to be of the same mind with the rest of the church. See, even in a really good church, as the church at Philippi was, uh, even in a really good church like Lehigh Valley Baptist Church is, there's always the potential that there's a few people who need to be told, get on board. You need to be like-minded. You need to get on the same page with everyone else. You need to be com committed to this work of the gospel and this work of missions and, 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 and this work of faith and this work of giving and this work of support and this work of spreading the gospel. You need to be on the same page. You need to be like-minded. And if that's you tonight, I would beseech you, be of the same mind. Be of the same mind. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that you've given to us. And Lord, we thank you for this truth. Lord, I pray for this church. Lord, I thank you for their testimony and Lord, the work that you've used them to do here and around the world in sharing the gospel of Christ. And Lord, I pray that they would determine, Lord, going forward, Lord, to again and continually take up that mantle that this church has worn faithfully in the past. Lord, that they would joyfully step into the yoke and Lord, by faith, trust God to work through them, being focused on that which they find only in you. Lord, that you would give them a heart to faithfully communicate with the affliction of those preaching the gospel around the world. Lord, that they might bring forth fruit to the glory of God and to offer that odor of a sweet smell and a sacrifice acceptable. We pray these things in Christ's name. As we remain seated tonight, the musicians are going to begin playing the invitation hymn, Make Me a Blessing. Could be that God has spoken to your heart tonight. I want to encourage you to do business with the Lord. Ask the Lord to allow us to be a blessing. We might have fruit that abounds to our account. Good challenge tonight, good reminder of why we do what we do.